Today on Airborne, Dragon makes orbit and heads for ISS resupply. The first South Carolina 787 has been delivered. And the AOPA controversy continues. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. On time and on spec, SpaceX's Dragon is now on its way to the ISS. Following a Sunday night 2035 Eastern Time launch, the Dragon capsule reached its planned orbit of 212 miles above Earth despite a single engine failure a little over a minute into the mission. The vehicle is on course to catch up to the station during the next couple of days. The Falcon 9's redundant engine configuration didn't miss a beat despite what appeared to be a pretty significant engine loss, while the vehicle simply extended the burn to make the needed orbital parameters. SpaceX launched the first of a dozen operational missions to deliver supplies to the International Space Station for NASA. The liftoff took place at Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, just a few miles south of the Space Shuttle launch pads. If all goes as planned, Dragon will arrive at the station on Wednesday, October 10th, where it will be grappled and berthed to the complex for an expected two-week visit. Dragon is scheduled to return to Earth on October 28th, for a parachute-assisted splashdown off the coast of Southern California. Dragon is reportedly the only space station cargo craft capable of returning a significant amount of supplies back to Earth, including experiments. Dragon will be filled with about 1,000 pounds of supplies, including critical materials, to support the 166 investigations planned for the station's Expedition 33 crew, of which 63 will be new. Dragon will return about 734 pounds of scientific materials, including results from human research, biotechnology materials, and education experiments, as well as about 504 pounds of space station hardware. Boeing on Friday marked a historic milestone with delivery of the first 787 Dreamliner built at its North Charleston, South Carolina facility to Air India. Boeing claims that the delivery marks the beginning of a new era of commercial airplane production in South Carolina. Work on the Boeing at South Carolina Final Assembly and Delivery Center began in November 2009. Production of the first South Carolina-built 787 began in mid-2011 and the completed airplane rolled out of the factory in April. Boeing South Carolina fabricates, integrates, and assembles the mid-body and aft-body fuselage sections for all 787 Dreamliners. Completed sections are joined in South Carolina final assembly or transported via the Dreamlifter to 787 Final Assembly in Everett, Washington. Friday's delivery marks the 28th 787 Dreamliner delivered to date. Boeing South Carolina will increase Final Assembly production to three 787s per month by the end of 2013. ANN continues to receive some very interesting input from our readers in response to the article we did a week ago on issues raised by those concerned with the current mission and direction of the post boyer era AOPA. Unfortunately, as part of ANN's continuing investigation, it dismays us to report that a simple request for some basic info on current compensation levels of the top officials at AOPA, updated info that will have to be disclosed in just a few days by law, but after the upcoming AOPA summit, was refused by an AOPA official. There's a lot more to tell, but to get all the latest details, be sure to check out this Monday's story at www.aero-news.net. 12 TG-10B gliders from the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs now belong to the Civil Air Patrol. 
The recent Air Force transfer of the aircraft to CAP is a boost to the Air Force Auxiliary's glider program. It will allow the Air Force Auxiliary to replace some of its older gliders and help modernize its existing fleet of 42 gliders. Ten of the Air Force Academy gliders will be used to upgrade the CAP soaring fleet, but two others not considered airworthy will be stored to supply parts for those that are in use. Eight of the gliders also come equipped with trailers to be used for storage and transportation. In fiscal year 2012, CAP flew 10,249 glider sorties, mostly cadet orientation and training flights. More than any year since 2005, when CAP began tracking glider flights online. A conventional two-place tandem basic training sailplane, the TG-10B is one of the world's most common soaring trainers. It has been used by the Air Force Academy for a number of years to introduce its cadets to flight. Like the Air Force Academy, CAPS uses its gliders to introduce America's youth to flight through its cadet orientation program. The opportunity to fly is a major attraction for cadets. Almost 32,000 orientation flights overall were provided in CAPS gliders and powered aircraft over the past year. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or our podcast, you can drop us an email to news by at aero news.net. Leaders of the Machinist Union at Bombardier in Wichita have rejected the company's latest contract offer and recommended that their members vote to decline management's contract offer and go on strike. And that's just what they've done. ANN's Tom Patton explains. The union voted to walk off the job as of Monday, with 79% of those participating voting to reject Bombardier's offer and go on strike. The current three-year contract expired at a minute after midnight, October 8th. In a statement, Bombardier Learjet said it put forward a, quote, fair and reasonable contract renewal offer to its unionized employees. While the company said it's disappointed the offer was rejected, it also said the negotiations team is available to continue talks and is hopeful that the union will soon return to the bargaining table. The Wichita Eagle reports the union represents about 825 workers at Bombardier's Learjet plant in Wichita. Union officials said that asking members to pay substantially more for their health care was the major sticking point in the proposed deal, though there were other issues, including the length of the contract. Bombardier says a contingency plan at the Wichita site has been implemented and the company is working towards minimizing disruption to the production line, its customers, and the community. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. The remains of seven U.S. servicemen lost in a PBJ-1 crash and missing in action since World War II have been identified and were buried with full military honors on October 4th in Arlington National Cemetery near Washington, D.C. Marine Corps First Lieutenant Laverne A. Lathathan, 22, of Raymond, Washington. Second Lieutenant Dwight D. Ekstam, 21, of Moline, Illinois. Second Lieutenant Walter B. Vincent, Jr., 21, of Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
Tech Sergeant James A. Sisney, 19, of Redwood City, California. Corporal Wayne R. Erickson, 19, of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Corporal John D. Yeager, 23, of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Private First Class John A. Donovan, 20, of Plymouth, Michigan. On April 22, 1944, the Marines were on board a PBJ-1 aircraft that failed to return from a night training mission over the island of Espiritu Santo and what is now known today as Vanatu. None of the seven crew members were recovered at the time, and in 1945, they were officially presumed deceased. In 1994, a group of private citizens notified the U.S. that aircraft wreckage had been found on the island of Espiritu Santo. Human remains were recovered from the site at that time and turned over to the Department of Defense. The FAA has approved the addition of Cessna 150 models L&M to Ag Aero's existing approval for Cessna models 120, 140, and 150 A through K for a complete muffler system. At the time, the company's manufacturing division has received FAA approval to manufacture a Taylorcraft wheel fender and Taylorcraft aileron ball stud. These new products add to the existing Taylorcraft line that includes lift struts, wing spars, fuel tanks, flying wires, and tail feathers. For over 51 years, Wag Aero has been a worldwide manufacturer and distributor of aircraft parts for the general aviation and LSA industries. It's Tuesday and time for another installment of our favorite feature. Our viewer suggested video we call the Aero Video of the Week. This week, take a gander as a non-amphibious float plane manages to take off from a decidedly non-aquatic grass strip via dolly. If you wondered how they did it, now you know. We don't usually cover stories about airlines' promotional gimmicks, but we had to tell you about this one. With the first 2012 presidential debate in the history books, JetBlue Airways says it's making good on an election protection promise. The chance for customers to freely leave the country and return home if they need a break because their candidate doesn't win. The airline is offering passengers the opportunity to select their choice for president and enter for a chance to win a free ticket to one of the airline's 21 international destinations if the election doesn't go their way. The airline site will offer a real-time map of customers' preferred destinations, and a social media ticker will track buzz around the campaign. After the results are in, JetBlue will give away 1,006 round-trip certificates. That's 2,012 seats to participants whose candidate lost. Tickets are good for round-trip travel from any airport JetBlue services, to 21 international non-stop destinations, including Aruba, Bahamas, Barbados, and many more. JetBlue has encouraged all Americans to get out and vote. And if your candidate doesn't win, well, maybe you can win for losing. That's our program for Tuesday, October 9th. Quick, concise, and convenient, you're always up to date when you're airborne with Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again this Friday with another edition of Airborne.